Hello, everybody. Welcome to the West Coast Elderberry Growers second workshop in our three part series on growing elderberries here out on the West Coast. Um, my name is Katie Renneker from Carmel Berry Company, and uh, I'm just here to welcome you. I, my apologies that it's taken a while to get this video out because in the middle of our workshop while we were recording with the live panelists, uh, my computer broke right in the middle of it. So we lost a portion of our recording, but the panelists have graciously uh, agreed to re-record their section and then I'm gonna edit it all back together. So um, that's why it's taken a little bit longer. The good news is, is that you're actually gonna get even more information because every single panelist said, well, I had a couple more things that I wanted to add. So um, that's the good news is that you're actually gonna get some bonus uh, information by having us re-record it. So without further ado, I'm going to start us out um, by sharing my screen so that you'll be able to see um, the beginning of the presentation. All right. So welcome to the West Coast Elderberry Growers second workshop. Today, we are going to be focusing on a few things. We're gonna to return to the rancher partnership that was discussed briefly in the first one. And that's with Tim Wilson up in, uh, in Washington. Then we're gonna talk about feeding, watering, pruning, basically the growing period of the elderberries um, here on the West Coast. So first I wanna introduce myself for those of you who might not have found us on the first workshop. I'm Katie Brenneker from Carmel Berry Company. I'm here in Monterey County in California, and I make a variety of products with elderberries and elderflowers. And um, we are always looking for new growers to join us in um, our supply because our commitment is to use only American elderberries, only American elderflowers, um, instead of the imported ones, which is most what, comp what most companies use. So that was a, a big reason why we started these workshops in addition to really wanting to further the research as best as we can support it here in the West Coast for growing elderberries. Who are West Coast elderberry growers? We talked about this in the first one, but I just wanted to briefly reintroduce everybody. We have Jed who's from Elderberry Grove up in um, British Columbia with Kirsten Zulievec from Oregon. We have Chris Patton, who's um, representing the Midwest Elderberry Co-op. We have the UC Serap team, which is um, a branch off of UC Davis. It's doing really excellent research on the cerulean elderberry, the blue elderberry here in California. And we also have Tim Wilson, who's up in Washington, um, uh, talking to us about his rancher partnership model. So, just a quick review, the types of elderberries that we are talking about. There's Sambucus nigra, that's the European elderberry. It's native to Europe. It's the one most commonly used in elderberry products um, because they have the most acres growing of that in the world. But we're also gonna be talking about Sambucus canadensis, which is the American elderberry. That's the one that's really native to east of the Rockies. It's the one that has been um, the most studied and where actually named cultivars have been studied um, and then released as named um, varietals. So it, those are varietals that have been selected for good yield, ease of harvest, good juice, etc. Then we have Sambucus cerulea. It's the native blue elderberry, also known as Sambucus mexicana. They're both the same native to the west coast, but that means all the way down into Mexico and all the way up into Canada. Um, it has a really wide range. And it's the one that is the least amount is known about it in terms of growing it as a commercial crop. And that is really a big focus of um, our learning and education that we're doing with West Coast elderberry growers. So we will be talking about all three of these because our Northern growers in Oregon, Washington, and um, especially British Columbia, um, they actually have a climate that works with European elderberry. So Jed will be talking a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, we're going to jump in. And now it's when you're going to see the, the parts edited back together. Um, we're going to start out with Tim Wilson talking about his rancher partnership model that he's doing up in Washington. 
So the rancher partnership model, unfortunately, Tim is so busy building a big project that you guys are going to hear about in the third workshop on February 3rd that you get to hear me talk about it instead of him. Um, but he and I have had some good discussions about it. So I do think that I'll be able to convey his meaning. Um, so the rancher partnership model basically is when you do not own your own land where you can um, plant your own elderberry, but you look around the, the land, the ranches, the farms in your community, and you notice that there's already elderberry growing um, and a hedgerow on somebody else's farm or um, on a ranch. And so the idea is, is that you build partnerships with those landowners and, um, you know, come to an agreement about being able to harvest on their land and pay them for it. Um, and at the same time, Tim has really figured out how to even have it be um, organically certified, and we will have a separate workshop on organic certification in the future. Um, but the idea is that you do not have to put up money for land yourself. Instead, you are arranging with uh, landowners. And so a lot of his, his emphasis is on the importance of the relationship that you are building with a landowner, because you're approaching them after you have figured out who the landowner is and he talked about that in the first workshop once you've kind of dialed that in the important thing is is to really build a relationship of trust find out what they're comfortable with and um and explain to them your goals about using the elderberries on their land um you can even uh suggest places where they can plant new ones so it's just a really great, smart idea because driving around in our community in Monterey County, there are elderberries everywhere on ranch roads. And um, so it's a, it's a smart way of being able to, um, to start even before you have your own land. Now, again, we'll talk about in the third workshop, the importance of harvest and post-harvest, especially if you are on you know, ranch roads or fence lines or something, there's going to be some criteria that is really important for food safety for harvesting um, from those trees. So keep that in mind, but um, don't dismiss the idea of elderberries um, and elder flowers, most importantly, too, um, if you don't have your own land. Hello, I'm Jed Weeb, and I grow elderberries in Salmon Arm, BC, Canada. So that's about as far north as you can grow elderberry Sambucus canadensis uh, commercially within North America. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. I may have different experiences from you and my bias. It might be slightly different, skewed by the fact that I'm dealing with a different set of problems than say someone who lives in a more Southern latitude going to share screen now. Share and where is the slides? Here we are. Oh, here's my introduction slide. Just to introduce myself. So you don't need to see that. Moving on to the amendments and corrections that I wanted to make from my last presentation. So I said that cuttings should range in the size from a pinky finger to a thumb thickness. And in fact, I meant to say that they should range in size from a quarter inch or about the thickness of a pencil to the thickness of the thumb. If your field is too wet or poorly drained, it's not a death sentence to your dreams. You can plant elderberry on berms or maybe a nice great big Hugo culture or something just to get them up and out of that wetness. They can't have wet feet. They have to be in a well-drained spot. Irrigation needs, you can see this nice picture of a drip irrigation line I've got for you. Drip irrigation is preferred method for watering elderberry. If at all possible, use drip. It's a really, really good system. Um, so elderberry needs about 1.5 to two inches of water per week, maybe one in some cases. Um, but if you're in a hot, dry, windy area, with soils that don't retain water well, you're gonna be looking more on the two inches side of water per week. Most areas, 1.5 inches will be enough or maybe even one. However, um, 
however, is not what I meant to say. What I meant to say was during rainy periods of the growing season, uh, that 1.5 inches, maybe all of it or a portion thereof might be supplied by rainfall. And yeah, so that's irrigation. Feeding and nutrition. So elderberries require adequate levels of all essential plant nutrients for optimal yield. Fortunately, most soils have near adequate quantity of the plant nutrients. But you'll probably have to make some amendments. And as you grow and harvest, of course, you have to replace what the plants have consumed and taken out of the soil. So we actually don't have a lot of knowledge, with some, there's not a lot of knowledge yet about feeding elderberry. So your local agronomist will not either. Um, it's very unlikely because elderberry is a niche and, um, and sorry, I just had a brain gap there. Elderberry is a bit of a niche and small, poorly known crop so far. So it's a good idea to try and emulate feeding models that are developed for other crops like blackberry or grape. So you can, if you're talking with an agronomist and trying to work out a, a, a nutrition plan for your elderberry farm, you could just say to them, hey, let's try and do something similar to what local, what's locally done in our region for blackberry or grape. We do have some general guidelines. They're from the University of Missouri, and they've been working for other elderberry farmers. So important to mention is nitrogen at least 80 pounds per acre. And that's going to be an annual thing because that's probably how much they're going to take out of the soil. So as far as phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium, and other plant nutrients, that can be determined by a soil test. And the recommended soil test results, this is numbers for Missouri, but it will be probably a bit similar. And, and you can use these as a bit of a guideline for wherever you live. So soil pH, 5.5 to 6.5, I mentioned that last time. Do try and amend that and fix that before you plant, because it's very hard, if not impossible, to do afterwards. Soil organic matter, 2 to 3% or higher if you got better. Elderberries do seem to do well in uh, soils with lots of organic matter. And we've got numbers here for phos phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. Just try, take your soil samples and try and keep your, these three within that range, just based on what your, what, what is needed based on what you can tell by reading your soil samples. Um, oh yeah, foliar sampling. So that is to monitor nutrient uptake, which is different from what nutrients are, are in the soil. This is what the plants are actually getting. So I love foliar sampling. I sent in three samples this season just to, to monitor and track and try and figure out, well, I, I was having a problem. So I recommend foliar sampling. It's particularly important if you're growing elderberry in an unusual soil, like I am, such as a pH that's out, the soil pH that's outside the normal range. But it's also of key importance when your plants appear unhealthy, because it can help you determine why. Um, yeah, it really can. So if you're having a problem, jump to foliar sampling pretty quick to see if you can use that as a tool to figure out what the problem is. So what you do is collect the entire leaf, including the petiole, and you send it into a lab, and then you compare their results to the, this example. And please feel free to, if you're doing this and you want a little bit of help, bring it up on the uh, Facebook forum. We, I can help, I can call up this, uh, someone can call up this chart again, if, in case you wanna see it again, when you're doing this and you can go into a little bit more detail about how to interpret your foliar samples. Moving on to common pests and diseases. And it's been pointed out to me by Katie that actually, it seems like I spent a lot of time on pests and diseases. I just wanted to show you these pictures of the different critters and give you like a really brief uh, summary of what they do and little things you could do to help prevent them. But their elderberry is generally, you know, Sambucus canadensis is a native to plant to North America and it usually does pretty well, provided it's got the right nutrition and the right conditions. Um, fairly hardy and disease problems. Most, report, most growers are reporting not having huge problems with diseases and bugs, but it can happen. And it's just, as far as monitoring goes, it's really good to be aware of what you're looking for. And when the problem comes up, 
I don't know, I just wanted to tell you what you might be looking for. So the first one here, this is an important one. Actually, this one is quite a big problem or quite a widespread problem, not necessarily quite a big problem. It's spotted-wing Drosophila. So it's almost everywhere. If you're planting elderberry, you're gonna have it. Probably already is in your region. So it's a fruit fly. It looks like a normal fruit fly, but it has these little spots on the wings. So if you look closely there, uh, I can't remember if that's the male or the female, but one of them has the spots on the wings. It's very unmistakable, but you may need magnifying glass to check that out. So it is difficult to manage organically, but possible. The number one rule is always remove all fruit when you're harvesting. Don't leave any fruit behind to decompose or fall on the ground or rot or whatever. So you pick the, soon, uh, the fruit as soon as it's ripe. I mean, wait for it to ripen properly. You don't have to pick it early or anything, but as soon as it's ripe, pick it. And that's um, going to help a lot. The best prevention is absolute exclusion netting. Netting with one millimeter holes that you can drape over the plant as soon as the fruits begin to ripen. It may be costly, it might be worth it. I don't know if anyone's doing that yet. Um, that's a really, really serious um, strategy with, with, yeah, with a large investment. Um, there's other things you can do, but if you wanted to try that, that would be very, very effective. So probably the most important thing to do though is monitor for spotted wing Drosophila known as SWD with a simple apple vinegar, apple cider vinegar trap. Uh, you can use neem oil via drip irrigation or other methods of application that might help. As a last resort, there are some organic permitted pesticides that might include Entrust, Pyganic, or, or Spinosad. Um, as far as cold climate growers like me are concerned, I've got some good news for you. Yay, good news for me. Um, there's some evidence that spotted wing Drosophila doesn't cause significant damage in climates similar to, in, in cold climates similar to Salmonar in BC. It just seems like our ripening period is so, so, so late um, that the spotted wing Drosophila can't really get a foothold. So it exists in my field. I have it. It's out there, reproducing, living, enjoying life in a sort of frigid way and chilly and shivering probably. It doesn't seem to be causing significant damage to um, my crop. So that could be a, a, a nice um, advantage or a bonus to growing elderberry in a uh, cold climate, a very, in a marginally, yeah, marginally is not the word, but in a, just a, a more northern part of the range of growing where it's possible to grow Sambucus canadensis. You've got that as a possible little advantage. So anyway, just check in on Facebook forums to see what other people are doing about spotted wing Drosophila and stay as it develops and people learn more good ways to deal with it. Um, Stay current and see what the best thing to do to deal with it is. So the erifid mite, I have a little trouble pronouncing that, sorry. Um, so certain varieties of elderberry have better resistance. Uh, you can control it with dormant oil. So that could be spraying dormant oil in spring. But most importantly, make sure that new cuttings that you're bringing into your plantation have been dipped before in dormant oil before planting. So that can kill the overwintering mites. I really recommend encouraging predatory mites and other arthropods. So a balanced ecosystem with a diversity of creatures is your best um, approach or your best approach for preventing an erifid mite problem. So you can see in my picture here in the slide, there's some different mulches and lots of vegetation encouraged in the alleyways. And that's just making a nice home for a wide variety of different predatory mites that, they, that can then crawl up those stems and eat the, if you have some bad mites eating your elderberries. Spider mites, I have that little, little question mark there at the bottom. I have had a couple outbreaks of spider mites in my field. How bizarre. I've never heard of anyone else having that problem. I suspect that you never would if you didn't have the nutritional problems that my elderberries face from being in a high pH soil and having sometimes I have wet conditions that are really hard on the plants. I do nothing about the spider mites and they go away. You see, um, which reminds me that what I wanted to say, and I just seem to have missed, for there is such a thing as miticides. You can spray miticides to kill erifid mite, but mite, miticides will kill predatory mites as well as the target species. So therefore they should be used only as a last resort and only to target particularly badly affected areas because in some cases, miticides can actually make the mite problem worse because it kills the predators. So be careful with that. Um, 
The Japanese beetle is rarely a serious problem, so you can again encourage predators for it. There's this fly called the taconid fly, which is attracted to plants in the gill and aster family, so you can plant some of those to encourage the predator, which eats the Japanese beetle. You can also hand collect them. People are hand collecting them into a bucket of soapy water. And yeah, it's rarely a serious problem. I thought we would take a look at the picture and make sure you know what it is. And then the second bug on this page is the elder borer. So you have already heard that in a certain small area in California, there's an endangered species of elder borer and you have to be careful to not harm it. In other areas, you have just a normal elder borer and well, it's rarely a serious problem in elderberry as well, but you do want to make sure you're aware what it is and that it's not going to be getting out of control in your field. So it bores into the canes and leaves little piles of sawdust brass. Um, where it exists as a problem, the best remedy is annual coppicing to the ground. So this kills beetles overwintering inside the canes. You chip up the canes then into small enough pieces that the beetle cannot overwinter in it, or you bury, burn them or bury all the prunings. The spindle worm it is another insect that bores into canes and leaves little piles of sawdust brass. So prune and destroy all canes as soon as you see the damage. See, this is in the moth butterfly family. It's a bit different, but um, it can yeah, it can be quite a, a bit damaging. But I don't, I'm not sure that it is a massive problem as long as you um, at least try and keep it under control by pruning out any canes that have been destroyed by it as they appear throughout the season. Oh, I have sawfly on here. Uh, it can defoliate the plants a little bit. I don't know a lot about sawfly, um, so I don't have much to say, but here's a picture of it. And um, if you see that guy eating the leaves, well, check out the University of Vermont Growing Elderberries Production Manual, um, just which is a good resource for any insect problem you have because it's very, uh, it's just a great, the elderberry rust is a fungus, so it's dependent on alternating its life cycle between one host plant and another host plant. The set, so one is the elderberry, and the other one is this, there's 12 species of sedge. So if you don't have one of those specific 12 species of sedge, you will not have elderberry rust. Uh, so lots of places in the west coast, you're going to be elderberry rust free. I'm not sure if elderberry rust, if any of the host species of sedge are on the west coast, but um, if you did have some of these, you could try and control the amount of sedge growing near your field and kind of try to get rid of them as much as possible. And you can, there's also some sprays you can use that are effective, um, some fungicide. The University of Missouri Extension website has some excellent information. So check that out. There are some leaf spot diseases. That's the second picture on this page. There's bacterial and fungal anthracnose. Um, the, they can occasionally become a problem. So improve airflow to your orchard, first thing you can do. Pruning and proper row spacing helps with airflow, keep the grass mowed low, so more air flows through. And as with any disease, nutrient deficiencies make the plants more vulnerable. So if you've got disease, send in a foliar sample right away and find out if there are any nutrient deficiencies that you can correct. Now, there are sprays to help control these leaf spot diseases. I have personal experience with an anthracnose, uh, fungal anthracnose, called, uh, which is a species of Colletotrichum. And I've been able to control it with a regime of copper octanoate spray. So it's like a copper soap that's organic approved and a foliar nutrition supplement that is, I figured out through foliar sampling to see what was missing from the plant. So with the, between those two things, I've been able to completely control my leaf spot disease it is no longer a problem for me. So I suspect that in my case, it was, was because I have this high pH soil, making the plants a little bit on the unhealthy side, a little bit more stressed and uh, too much humidity and poor airflow in my orchard. So deal with humidity and airflow first and nutrient problems. Uh, the tomato ring spot virus, not on my slide, but I wanted to mention it. It weakens and slowly kills the plant. It's spread by nematodes. Check out the University of Vermont Growing Elderberries Production Manual to learn more about it. Um, from my understanding, it's seldom a problem, but it can be a problem. Oh, and there is also another new elderberry virus I don't know too much about, but um, might be something to look into if you're having a problem with 
your, your plants just not doing well. Anyway, those are the, some of the diseases that I wanted to highlight, just show some pictures, just uh, to be aware if you see these things popping up in your orchard. But um, yeah, like I said, elderberry is generally pretty hardy and as long as you have reasonably good soil, um, your plants should be pretty healthy. Just keep an eye out that these, some of these bugs don't get healthy populations going as well to benefit from all your hard work. In on and on to pruning. Um, why are we doing pruning? So this is important. Why? Like, why do we have to prune these things? Effective pruning improves production and it makes the berries easier to pick. And we're talking significantly improved harvest efficiency. It can make a really big difference to help make the berries quicker and easier to pick. So pruning can also serve to remove disease infested wood and overwintering insects. And it allows more air and light into the bush, reducing disease, you know, we were just talking about that. And it ensures a constant supply of strong new fruit bearing wood. So I think pruning is very important. Um, the common pruning style for Sambucus canadensis. So this is for growers of Sambucus canadensis in most regions, excluding the ex sort of extreme short season climates like the north, like where I live. So in most regions, you can simply prune the elderberry right to the ground. And I mean, within an inch of the ground. So this can be done annually, or this is done annually during the winter when the plants are completely dormant. Um, ideally like January or December, January kind of thing. Depending on where you are and how long your winter is, you might have a bigger window than somebody else. <laughs> um, so you can accomplish this by hand with a heavy duty sickle bar more like, um, one that maybe we cut corn or something with, or even with a brush mower. So the fascinating, um, fascinating advantage to pruning right to the ground is it forces the bush to produce only on new wood. So that's new shoots originating right from the ground. These are called primokings. So these have larger clusters of berries and they ripen during a smaller time window. So that can improve harvest efficiency quite a lot and um, reduce the time period which your spotted winged Drosophila can feed on the berries and get their, and reduce the amount of time that they have the opportunity for their population to blow up. Um, so the boring insects, the borer insects and elderberry rust are also controlled with this style of pruning. It helps a lot. Uh, so you're gonna chip up or mulch or remove all prunings, you know, burn them, bury them, whatever, chip them finely. So yeah, if you live anywhere that's not an extreme short growing season, like I have in Salmon Arm, BC, you probably want to prune right to the ground. It's a great way to go. However, in the, in the short season environments, um, so climate similar to mine, the growing season is short, pruning is a totally different story. The growing season is not long enough for, for fruit born on these primocanes that I was just describing to you to ripen properly. So there's a solution. You grow elderberry on shoots which originate from other branches, not from the ground. Um, so these are non-primocane shoots and they will produce berries which will ripen two weeks early. So that's the extra two weeks we need. And this is how to get it. Just cut the plant a little bit taller and um, your berries are gonna ripen um, earlier. So, I recommend purchasing an electric backpack pruner, as you see in the picture. This is an older model. I bought it secondhand, and I bought a four foot long extension pole for it, so I do not have to bend over to prune. I love it. I just, it's just, it's a really good tool. So this is what all the viticulturists and orchardists use for um, commercial pruning operations. So what, the, my, guidelines for pruning in the extreme short season uh, environments like where I live, cut back the bushes to one to two feet, leaving two or three nodes, then reduce the number of canes to six to 10. Now this depends on the age, the vigor, variety, and how close it is to the next nearest bush. So first you're gonna go through, once you got it cut down to that height and you find that you have too many, you wanna reduce the number to six to 10, First, get rid of the older canes, then get rid of small crappy ones. And then if you still have more than six or 10, just cut out a few more until you got it kind of thinned out. You see, you want to get, um, a, 
you want to get the renewal of new branches in balance with the amount that you're removing. So the more harshly you prune, the more of these primocanes will be produced this season, to bear fruit, which will bear fruit on their side shoots the next year after you've cut them down to two feet the following winter, right? So you'll know you're removing too little when you're pruning if no primocanes appear the following year. You will know you're perfectly in balance when there's an equal number of old canes to remove. You just cut out six to 10 old canes and then you leave behind six to 10 new canes and that will be for the next year's fruit. This is a really good time for me to mention that many Sambucus, wild Sambucus canadensis, as well, if not most, as well as the variety Johns, cannot be pruned back to the ground anyway, because they will not produce on primocane. So they would require this exact same style of pruning. Um, and so does Sambucus, well, no wait, let me say this correctly. Sambucus nigra also does not produce fruit on primocane. So it also requires different strategies for pruning. And moving on to Sambucus nigra. So what is up with the European subspecies? Look at these weird looking plants, beautiful and I think super cool. I'd love to grow an orchard that looks like this and I'm working on it, we'll see how that goes. So there are three growers in BC who are growing Sambucus nigra that I know of. Um, we don't really have a good example of a commercial orchard that is both well managed in terms of pruning, um, well pruned, as well as long term established. So, but it does seem possible to grow them here. because We have kind of a European climate. In Europe, their natural range is roughly correlated to areas which do not get colder than minus 25 degrees Celsius in winter. Furthermore, they cannot pollinate and set fruit in regions with very hot summers. So most of North America is either too hot in summer or too cold in winter. West Coast, I'm thinking here, BC, Washington, Oregon, for sure parts of California, if not all of it, um, might be suitable for growing Sambucus nigra. If we can get it to grow here, we could be looking at significant rewards. European growers do report very high yields per acre. Um, yeah, it'd be neat to see if we can do that here too. I would love anything that improves productivity is something neat to, to look into and see if you can try, have it have success with that on your farm. Um, let's quickly move on to pruning Sambucus nigra. Um, right, there's a whole bunch of diseases, a whole myriad of diseases and pests for Sambucus nigra, something like 60. But we're not gonna go into that. So I guess that's the downside because I don't even know, I don't know enough about the diseases of Sambucus nigra. And also we don't even know how many of these diseases exist or, or insects exist in North America um, because it's so new growing Sambucus nigra as a commercial crop in North America. So instead, we're just gonna talk a little bit about pruning style. So Sambucus nigra is different than Sambucus canadensis. It cannot grow fruit on primocanes. Only fruits on shoots originating from second year wood. So this is very similar to most grape varieties, right? Um, furthermore, it seems to have a tendency to not produce fruit on shoots originating from locations on the trunk that are within three feet from the ground. So you can see we've got in the pictures how they have worked to solve that problem, that problem, that tendency. Um, the other thing is it likes to seem to produce many smaller clusters as opposed to the fewer larger clusters of Sambucus canadensis. So thus, the it's a different type of renewal pruning method. And uh, this it has been, these methods have been developed over six plus decades in Europe. And the idea, their idea is to encourage the annual formation of shoots with large numbers of buds which each have the fruiting potential for the following season. So the single trunk training system is what I've chosen to show you here. It seems to be by far the most popular in Europe. It results in elderberry plantations, which appear more similar looking from a distance to a conventional fruit orchard. So the elders are spaced far apart, rows are 15 feet wide, eight to 12 feet of spacing within the row. And the shape of the elders pruned this way looks more like a conventional like a peach or an apple or cherry tree or something, you know, you can see from the picture, it's different from how Sambucus canadensis is growing in, hedge, in kind of hedges. 
So how is this accomplished? You know that that elderberry like doesn't really naturally grow like this. Um, at least not Sambucus nigra. It likes to have three or five branches. So what you're going to do is the very first season you train the elder to grow into one single trunk. So as the season goes, you have to pluck off every single little like shoot and sucker as it appears and just leave just that one single trunk to grow up so that you get a nice big, the plant invests lots of energy into one big trunk. And then by the second season, hopefully you can top the canes at 31 to 40 inches. This is ideal. I've seen examples where they're pruned taller or shorter than that. And then that season, that summer, the second summer, you're gonna encourage the elder to produce four branches originating from those top two buds. Um, then you would let it produce a few more each year subsequently. So each of these, so these four main branches, it starts with four and eventually as the bush gets older, it's 12 or something, some other number, depending on how vigorous the bush is. Um, we'll call those the skeletal or scaffold branches. So from each of those branches, you can see like on the picture, well, in either of these pictures, they're nice, strong, long whips. Those branches, shoots will emerge from those branches next, the following year, which will, which will bear the fruit. So, and then the year after, these four, these four branches, or in the, if it's an older bush, it's a larger number than four, they'll be pruned back and new one-year-old shoots, whips, just like in the pictures, will be left behind to produce fruit that season. Um, whoop, where are we? Okay, so the goal of pruning Sambucus nigra is ultimately very similar to Sambucus canadensis. It's about renewal. You want to cut back enough so that the tree is stimulated to produce a sufficient number of new, new shoots, which are the scaffold branches, which will then produce the fruit bearing branches the following year. So if you leave too many buds on the skeletal scaffold branches, so like there's too long or you leave too many skeletal scaffold branches, the tree will produce a bounteous crop the following, like that summer, but it will fail to produce any good strong shoots which are needed to produce next year's fruiting branches. So you gotta get, get the balance right. If you leave too few buds on these branches, too few buds or branches, you'll see lots of vegetative growth and a much smaller berry crop, but set up for a really good crop the following year. Anyway, that's what I know about pruning Sambucus nigra. I'm mostly transmitting information to you that I know from reading, not from actual practice. But um, as I have more experience with it, we'll be showing lots more, sharing more pictures on the Facebook groups and see how my successes go. And we've got a bunch of different types of Sambucus nigra that I'm testing out growing in my own fields, and well, they look healthy. So uh, and they produce some nice berries so far. Um, anyway. That's my presentation. I hope that there was something in it that will be helpful, beneficial to you. And I want to remind you, the Facebook forums are awesome. Ask tons of questions there. People love answering each other's questions. The more questions, the happier the other participants in the group are because they're ready to answer your questions. Whatever your questions are, put them there and you might get an answer faster than you think. Anyway, have a great day. And um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Jed. Next up, we've got Chris from the Midwest Elderberry Co-op. He's going to be talking with us about trials that he has done in the upper Midwest, also with Nigra and um, Canadensis. So here you go, Chris, thanks. Thanks, Katie. And hello, everyone, once again, from the Midwest. It is really exciting to see so many new growers getting more experience and being willing to take the time and effort to, to share their experiences with you. And I'm, I'm learning a lot about the Pacific Northwest blue elderberry, cerulea. It's something I've always wondered about and haven't really had a chance to see your study in person yet. And I hope to do that in the future. I really liked uh, Jed's comments and the things he had to say about uh, growing in the north. And as you'll note in the slide, I have some presentations from over the last five years on the mid 
West Elderberry Cooperative website. And I've got a few examples here for you. Uh, so this is Marge, which is uh, the Nigra adapted to uh, the Midwest in particular. Uh, I don't have all the details on the genetics, but the University of Missouri does think of it as a Nigra, and it grows that way. It, uh, as mentioned, it really doesn't spread from the roots very far. It's all sort of clumped by the trunk. And this is a sample of uh, how I prune it along my fence line. And if I didn't prune it back to that, it would have a lot of little branches coming up close around that central trunk. As you can see on the right, how it looks uh, three months later in June. It's very vigorous, does very well in the north. The cymes are smaller. The berries are about four times larger. And I find you know, for us, even in uh, Minnesota, it was uh, the first to get leaves and the last to lose those leaves. But the main thing there is that you do have to prune it. And on a larger scale, that's not practical. On a smaller scale, or if you do have labor available, and particularly in the north, pruning like this and choosing other wild cultivars that you can prune like this that maybe uh, don't necessarily like to be cut close to the ground but have other good characteristics of flowers or berries as, as possible. And I have uh, a sample of that. Uh, I've got uh, several wild ones I've been trialing in my yard. I call one Floribunda because it's got such big beautiful flowers. Another one called Trifecta because it has uh, uh, the phenotype has like three uh, flower clusters coming off the top. The little arms are, are all always turned into flowers. Um, many of the elder have little arms off to the left or right. As you can see on the left hand side under Floribunda, you see the little leaf arms coming out. Well, with Trifecta, this very commonly are three flower clusters. It's the same uh, basic cyme, but the cyme is uh, broken apart. Uh, this is a Floribunda flower, and then you can see it's big, it's lovely, it's very, very fragrant and massive. Uh, the berries don't ripen overly evenly, but they do ripen even enough, and I, I do harvest them. They're good berries. And this is a sample of how I prune the Floribunda um, and what it looked like in March and June. And so these slides were taken from that presentation slide, and uh, you can uh, find the whole thing and all the notes there online. I, I am really excited. To, to work with growers across the country, even though Midwest Elderberry Cooperative has Midwest in the name. Uh, really, I have growers literally from California to Virginia who are members, and we're working on developing regional hubs. I'm working with Tim Wilson up in Washington. We're seeing how that can go, and I'm helping him to sell some of the cerulea. And we've got another one developing in, in North Central Florida. Uh, focus looking more around the area of bulk juice and then in west central Minnesota about 40 miles west of the Twin Cities we've got another major hub where we're looking at anywhere from 40 to 200 acres uh, and there we're actually working with um, a nonprofit farm for disabled veterans and uh, we're looking at putting disabled veterans to work and making elderberry ingredients so Really, elderberry is very flexible. There's a lot of ways you can use it. From the co-op standpoint, most of our members are small producers and they, they make their own products. We will buy and help sell uh, any elderberries more than that they grow more than they need. But more often what we find is uh, the producers, the on-farm producers need more berries and so we supply them with what we have available to help them to succeed. Uh, elderberry is really great. And I think that by healing the environment will help to heal humanity as well. And so I want to encourage you to keep growing and keep learning about it.
I'll turn it back to you, Katie. Okay, so now we've been learning about the Sambucus nigra canadensis and Sambucus nigra, and now we're ready for Dr. Pearson in Oregon with an overview of um, Sambucus cerulea, and we're going to be talking about the general care watering pests and diseases, and the big one is pruning. So take it away, Kirsten. Yes, thank you so much, Katie. Um, so I should probably preface this with, this is all very new, of course, Cerulea. We have a lot of information or a lot of um, growing history with the commercial use for Canadensis and for the European varieties. We don't really have a lot of background or um, specific information going forward with Cerulea. So a lot of this is kind of going to be pulled in based on what we know with Canadensis, and then that'll create kind of a baseline for us going forward and where we want to go as growers. Of course, with any crop that you grow, you have a baseline for what that crop prefers. And then when you're looking at it regionally growing, we're, we're adapting um, our own soil, changing our nitrogen, looking at our pruning and our watering, all based upon what is happening with our crop in our region. But to establish that baseline, this is kind of going to be our recommendation going forward, which is Basically, to reiterate what Jed talked about, we're going to be using pretty much the Canadensis uh, baseline for nutrition and watering and, and so on and so forth. But I thought it would be important to put it in context for Cerulea, what we know. Um, so we're going to talk about the general care, the watering, the pest, the disease, the pruning. Of course, you can see that beautiful um, Sambucus nigra subspecies, Cerulea, which some people also refer to as Mexicana. Uh, that's really known for that powdery blue exterior on the berry. It's still a nice purpley black berry, but uh, underneath that beautiful coating. So that's going to be the first way that you're going to recognize that plant, of course. So the next one going into the general care, the watering, pest disease, and pruning. Pruning is probably going to be the real big thing that we're going to hit on today because a lot of, like I said, our recommendations for watering and uh, nutrition or inputs into the field are really going to mimic what we know about canadensis, but it's going to split off and we're going to take a different approach for pruning and we'll talk about, about why we would want to do that. And two kind of main methods for pruning these cerulea is, um, is going to be something we're also going to discuss. So let's look at the next slide, if you will, Katie, and let's talk about just the um, very big, so I have my my helper today. So <laughs> we love it. My my daughter, yes, the age of Zoom just to requires these kinds of things. So when we talk about the light requirements, um, of course, we know that elderberry tends to grow on the outskirts of a forested or wooded area. They grow in the central clearings in those wooded areas, and um, they can tolerate somewhat um, dappled light or some shade. But really, when we're talking about increased production, we have to maximize, um, those chips are a little loud, honey, <laughs> but we have to maximize our production. So when we're looking at giving up acreage for, for growing a commercial crop, we want to try to get as much out of that commercial crop as we can. And so while they will grow in watery conditions, they're, you know, they will tolerate wet feet, we say, um, they do optimal when they have good drained soil. They do optimal for production when they have a good amount of light. So our recommendations for cerulea, of course, will be full sun to just part shade. And the more sun you can give them, the more you're going to have improved productivity, of course. You're going to see better berry quality. It's going to ripen most likely faster. And you'll just, you'll just have an overall more productive um, shrub, really. So soil, it really does prefer well-drained soil. And this is kind of something we talk about a lot in the West Coast Growers Group, the, uh, the other elderberry grower group, our hobby group, that people say, well, it's okay, you can plant it in a marshy area. Well, you can, and, uh, and it will tolerate some wet feet. Some will tolerate it better than others. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind that we're trying to do maximize our inputs and uh, are, we're trying to minimize our inputs and maximize the outputs, of course. And so you don't really want to tie up land space, I guess, because it's poorly drained and you have a crop that isn't doing so well. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this needs to go over there. Okay. Yeah. 
So we might want to start part of that over again because I cannot hear with that chip bag. We, we can mind. hear you. I can okay, hear you. Good. Okay, good. Okay. I can hear the chip bag. Um, so it does prefer well-drained soil. Now, that being said, one of the recommendations Oregon State University had made to me when they came out to my field was you should hill all these up. And so you have raised berms basically for each of these um, for each of these rows that you have your elders in. And that sounds like really a good idea, but however, our area actually does drain relatively well. And so I don't feel like I need to do that for my area. Um, so one of the things to consider is um, when you hill it up quite a bit, you're adding an extra couple feet in height to something that could become an obstacle later on when you're trying to do harvest. Um, we see a lot of berms and swales being used in permaculture. And there is a growing trend to put um, plantings in there of elderberry, and that's wonderful. But if you're thinking about just for commercial value as well, it might pose some minor obstacles as far as having to bring uh, ladders into the orchards for harvest, which can, if you're a employer, you understand what that's going to do for safety in the field and insurance. So try to use drain yes exactly so try to try to do well drained soil if you can um and then uh, if you have to plant them in swales just understand that there might be some harvest considerations as well now as far as the soil range you know we generally say with elders five and a half to six and a half on the ph scale for canadensis seems to be the same for cerulea. However, we have noticed that it does tend to grow quite well in soils that are more slightly acidic. So if you might be higher in that range or just at the top of it, maybe just outside of it, you may still find that cerulea, if you can get it to grow in your climate, might be a really good option instead of making a lot of soil amendments. Um, so fertilization, I know Jed gave some really comprehensive in-depth uh, discussions on fertilization. I don't have a lot much more to add to that other than to make sure in the spring prior to bud break you want to get that uh, nitrogen into that to soil and then um, when you put them down to bed for the winter prior to uh, pruning or coppicing you'll want to give them a good a low dose of nitrogen fertilizer to set them for the winter. That doesn't mean they're, that's all they're going to need, or it doesn't even mean that you have to do that. Your soil might be different. You might not have to do it. It might not be your approach, but um, you might find that uh, that uh, foliar uh, fertilization might be a really good option right up until it starts to um, fruit. So you'll have to play around a little bit with those recommendations, what's going to work good for you. But our baseline recommendation is try to get some sort of fertilizer on a once or twice a year, maybe think about a foliar application prior to berry set. And I think we probably will be looking into that more in the, you know, as people start planting cerulea more um, in a commercial setting, because like the UC Davis study, they, they, there was not an emphasis on adding fertilizer at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think that some of the farms amended when they planted, but no further amendments were added um, and so it didn't seem to affect their harvest, you know, and the ones that are planted in hedgerows that have been in hedgerows for a long time, nobody's fertilizing them and they're still doing pretty well. So it's possible right. that cerulea as a whole won't need as much babying as right. canadensis out here. Yeah, so. I hope I hope so, because the, you know, once again, when you're looking at yield per acre and then keeping those inputs down, that's a really positive, right. especially yeah. when you're looking at maybe growing organic, the less that you have to put on it, the less that you have to try to find that's acceptable is a, such a plus as well. Right. So we're just all still at the beginning of figuring this out. Uh, yeah, I think that that really does um, merit repeating multiple times because I get an increasing amount of questions about cerulea and there's a lot of excitement about this where how can I prune it how do I care for it where do I get it how do I propagate it all the same questions over and over again right. and a lot of the times our answers are really we don't know yeah and, oh you have a really great idea take it and run right. with it because you may be the expert you know you've got one that you say roots really easy great you may have the key because 
there's no absolutes and there's certainly no absolutes in, in the plant world when it comes to propagating these elders. Some may root more difficult than others as a general rule. Well, there might be that one plant that we haven't discovered yet that's a ceruleae that just wants to root that has nice bumpy uh, lenticels and it's ready to go, but um, other ones might not be. So everybody should get out there, look at their cuttings, take cuttings, try it, try a variety of ways because you just might uh, be the very first one to have a ceruleate variety named after you or your location. Right. So that's what's so exciting. Um, so yes, watering. it. The thing about a ceruleate in comparison from canadensis from what we can tell is that it is much more dry and drought tolerant. So we see this uh, variety growing in high high mountain ranges, it's growing down in desert areas, it's growing in very rocky uh, cliff sides. It's amazing where this plant will grow. I suspect, and I uh, was talking with, um, I think Jed, that possibly the root system on these ones might be a lot deeper. So you might have a much greater tap root that is going deeper than uh, what we're seeing from canadensis, which tends to have more of a root system similar to grapes, sort of somewhat shallow. And so um, that might be why when we talked about watering recommendations last time that you were saying UC Syrup said that that uh, deep watering in the winter was most beneficial, giving it time to really get down into the ground. So my, my thought is it's growing well in those areas because I think it has a much more deep aggressive root system than what we've typically seen out of um, other elders. So when unsure, just make sure any plant that you're starting out with, it should get regular water. Now, I know that there are some thoughts in dry farming where you want to wilt the seedling and you want to expose it to uh, brief and extended periods of drought throughout its, its growing to kind of hardwire into it to not be so water dependent. Um, so there is, there is that thought as well. Um, I don't know, we just don't know. Um, maybe that's gonna be something that we do when we play with seedlings. But, um, but in that first year, our recommendation for growing these as a hedgerow for production or in an orchard setting would be to let them get established with a good amount of water. Canadensis, their recommendations are around one to two inches per week. I really don't know what that means for us in the wetter, normer, normer, sorry, northern climates. Wow, the wetter northern climates. I'm not really sure if um, we need to apply that much water, if nature is going to do its job. Um, we're not really sure. So one of the things I can suggest always is get them established, keep them watered, and keep them heavily mulched. Now, when I'm going into the field, probably in a couple of weeks, and I'll be putting some sticks in the ground, and we'll be talking in about mulching and bed site preparation going into into um, planting, but you definitely want to keep it well mulched to help aid in that moisture retention so you're not wasting your water. So you had some really interesting things though that I wanted to talk about, Katie, about um, UC syrup in watering the plant in the winter. Yeah, so the UC syrup study that was with UC Davis last year, um, well a couple years ago, and their farms actually found that the 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 farms that did the farm that did the best um, was continually watering um, one time per week for the first couple of years, uh, and then then the third year of the study, which I think they're summarizing right now, was that they I don't think any water was applied; it was fully naturalized in it, um, and it didn't seem to affect uh, harvest. So. Um, but the farms that did not receive any water helping them get established, their yield was really low. It was, it was much lower. Um, and the, the last one is there's a California grower um, close to me here in, it's south of me in Monterey County, um, where they just have been following the trees on their ranch for many years, for decades actually. And they realized that the years that had the best yield are the ones that had a really good winter rainy season. So it didn't really matter if they watered later on in August when the fruit was setting. It actually was more dependent on did the plants get a good amount of water back in February when it should should be getting water. So um, that's just an interesting side that these plants, it could be that they need the water when nature would provide it, even if to help it later on. So yeah. Right, right. That's so interesting. So I 
I'm, I'm just, it all brings me back to the question of what are those roots? What does that root system look like? Right. So other, other nerdy elderberry questions that we could easily go off on. Yeah. Um, so yes, what is the next one here? Sorry, pests and disease. Yeah, you know, we're, so what I'm gonna say is somewhat general and you feel free to jump in when we talk about pruning uh, that is very specific to your area. Up where we're gonna be up north of you, it's not gonna be an issue for pests and disease as far as we can prune as we need to. One of the things that you guys should think about is verticulum wilt in this area in the Pacific Northwest Washington and Oregon, we are huge producers of peppermint and peppermint carries verticulum wilt in the soil. It's a pathogen. You'll have to ask for the test to be done when you're, in so when you're submitting your soil test. The only reason I say this is that um, the, the property that, that we lease out to another farm for decades, they had um, cycled in and out peppermint, commercial peppermint for distillation and they had stopped planting it and had put in fescue. And so I finally had asked the farmer, why did you stop planting that? And he said, well, we're having issues with rust and verticulum wilt. And once that gets in your soil, there's no way to mitigate that. It doesn't ever go out. It's a pathogen. It stays in the soil. You can get those numbers down, but it will pretty much always be in your soil to some degree. And verticulum wilt can just kill half a plant or can be extremely devastating to your entire crop. Test for it early if you're looking at a piece of land and make sure that you're testing your soil in grids so that you know that if you've got a 50 acre spread, you know exactly where that soil sample is coming from. The other issue is uh, elderberry, which I should say rust itself is not devastating to a plant. It looks kind of funky and it's a bit terrifying at first, but it's not, you just prune it out. It's not a big deal. But elderberry borer is gonna be one that could definitely affect um, to some degree uh, your overall cane health. Um, our pruning here is not going to be as uh, as restricted as what it is, and this might be a good chance to talk about that. UC Davis. Um, uh, yeah, sh shortly in the workshop, we'll be hearing from Sonia um, from UC Serap, and she's going to go into the details of the um, a very specific area of California where you have some pruning restrictions because of the presence of an endangered beetle. So. We'll get, we'll get there in just a few minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you. The next one would be um, mites. And uh, this is, is not hugely devastating, but it can cause um, uh, the leaves to look deformed and it's it, pretty easy to treat. It's a two applications of dormant oil um, prior to bud break. It's actually one about seven to 10 days prior to bud break as the buds swell, you'll just go through and uh, using a simple sprayer, spray down your field with the dormant oil and then about another right at bud break or just a few days after bud break, go in and do the same thing and it kind of smothers those mites. Or if for some reason you see it spring up in your field, it's okay. You just will spray it with the dormant oil. There's some considerations. If the sun is really bright, you wouldn't want to do it then. And those are all things that we can discuss later, but it is somewhat um, easily controlled and not the end of the world. The other issue is the spotted wing dros drosophila. I have the worst time saying that. Uh, let's just call it the spotted wing okay. terror. Yeah, the spotted wing terror in the orchard. Uh, we did post a video up on the West Coast elderberry group where we had talked about identifying it. It's these tiny little fruit fly maggots that just kind of ferment and make a mess out of your field. It is a real problem here in the Pacific Northwest. We're uh, the home of small fruit production, especially here in the Valley. And so we're very familiar with these pests from the home garden aspect to the commercial growing aspect as well. And you can trap them, you can um, manage them with proper pruning, which we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of pruning right now. One of the common ways um, in uh, growing canadensis is to take all the flowers that come low on the, on the bush and clip those off and use those for your flower production because you don't want them to fruit. You don't want any of that fruit to come in contact with the soil um, because it can increase the likelihood of having problems with those spotted wing um, terrors, we'll just call them. So yeah. So and you can said all that, I mean, in general out here where we are in California, I would say that the, the pests are not really dominant for either canadensis or cerulea. I mean, it, it could be just that we're fortunate right now, but you know, these are the worst case scenarios that Jed went through and that you're going through because we have to know about them. Education is power.
but right. is, is that they are not, um, you know, they're, they're not a huge dominant force in elderberry growing as it stands right now anyway. At right. Least, I don't know about for you up there. Yeah, no, here in the Valley, this is, if you're in, if you're in Oregon's Willamette Valley, these are going to be a real, these could be a real pest. Right. And so uh, proper orchard management, which is cleaning up debris, cleaning up um, fallen fruit out of your alleys is going to be huge. Um, the other one will be making sure that you're managing it through proper pruning, flower harvesting, and then using traps. That's really one of the things that we're having the best luck with is trapping in those orchards right now. Because insecticides, it seems like they are able to um, kind of evolve around each of those insecticide applications quite rapidly and they tend to be not as effective. So, cool. all right. Good times, but yeah, it's not the end of the world. We'll get through it. It's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll manage these pests. So let's talk about pruning. What we know about Sambucus nigra, cerulea, um, we know that its natural state, it likes to grow in a, in a solitary, almost tree form. People people often just say, I have a, I have a elderberry tree in my yard. And I go, okay, I think they probably mean cerulea because it grows naturally into into kind of a dominant tree shape, uh, one of those canes, because it is a bush, it's it's not actually a, a tree, but it's just that over many, many years, one cane will kind of become a dominant shape or dominant trunk really. And it starts to sucker less and less and less the older that it gets. And then oftentimes like this tree in the right-hand side of the screen, um, it's in a landscape. And so they've pruned out those suckers and they've just allowed that one single trunk to grow quite nicely. I believe that when I clicked on that photo, it was an example of a Mexicana, which is the cerulea, of course. It's just a more dry climate plant. Um, and for some reason, they people refer to it as two different plants, but it's the same one. So it wants to grow in kind of a wild state. It's a huge plant, really, if you think about it. It's 10 to 25 feet high. They'll say it's 10 to 15 feet, but I've seen them 20, 25 okay. feet high. Yeah, they're massive, and they're eight, they're 8 to 15 feet wide easily. Um, so looking at the shape of that, and when we compare it to the European nigra, they're somewhat similar in scale. And how in Europe they're managing that size is to use selective pruning. And we'll kind of talk a, a little bit later, how do we get that lovely tree shape that we see on the side of that slide there into our orchards? And do we wanna do it? What are the benefits of that? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. We can go on to the next slide. So with pruning, we have what we call coppicing. And coppicing is we're cutting down anywhere around six inches. Now, colder climates like Jed, he'll coppice his a lot taller um, than what we will. Maybe I think he said a foot and a half, if I remember right or so. That gives him a little bit of a head start come spring because he has a very shortened growing season. Um, we will here in Oregon and Washington, we can cut them down to about six inches and, uh, and that helps us to control pests. But uh, for cerulea, it just, in, in, and I have to preface this with the kind of in the colder climates in the Pacific Northwest, the Northern regions, we're not going to recommend um, chopping cerulea back all the way because we have a shortened growing season as well. And there does appear to be primocanes and floricanes. So what that means is that you have first year growth and then on the second year, that previous growth will then turn into those fruiting canes. So if you cut them off, we have too short of a growing season and we're not gonna typically see that um, flower and fruit in the same year that it's been cut down. Now, that being said, I have to preface that and turn it back over to Katie, who's seen something different in her warmer climate. Yeah, and I think we have a slide for that. Actually, at the end of these slides, I think I have one for where I am. So we'll get to that. Yeah. So, but generally speaking, in uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we're going to say not to uh, completely coppice that cerulea down. Now, I have seen a lot of photos where people are cutting it back to control the shape and size in their landscape, and they're still getting fruit that year. And that um, I could see where that would be would be fine. But um, annual dormant coppicing in the winter just may actually result in no fruit at all for that following spring or summer. So it's entirely up to, to folks as they start farming these to say, hey, I think I'm going to take these first, you know, three or five plants in each of my rows and just 
trim them back at varying heights. Um, this is where the farmer has to be a bit of a researcher yeah. and figure out what works best in their field. So and that being said, let's talk about some of the ideas. We talked about coppicing. We're not recommending that for cerulei. So the next option would be kind of selective pruning. And we can see here from this one, this is a very common kind of orchard form that you would see. We see it kind of in um, filbert trees or hazelnuts. It's a very common shape for um, orchards. And what they've done is here is they've picked three or four of their strongest canes and they've let those develop. And then off of that, uh, they have established um, um, every year which one are gonna be their primal canes and which are gonna be their floricanes. And after something is done pruning, they're going in and trimming that off and, uh, and selectively pruning that. It helps to open up the inside of that canopy for improved light and um, airflow keeps pests down. As you can see, as this is starting to fruit, there are no branches that are hanging down and touching the ground. So that helps to mitigate pest and disease in the orchard as well. So this natural form of this, of this uh, shrub is reinforced. Now the downside to this is that this is such a large um, tree or bush rather in this form that you could decrease operational space in between the rows as you're trying to get your equipment in there. It's also a little bit taller and you have to wonder, am, am I gonna have to use ladders or am I gonna step on the back of a truck to get in there to get my picking done? What do we have to do to do that? So there are some down, downsizes to, downsides to this. This is popular in, I wanna say that Patrick Byers over at the University of Missouri did a presentation and he showed when he was, I think, in Denmark, and they had a very similar shape to this, to mm -hmm. their trees. And it's uh, just kind of standard for how a lot of those growers will do this. So wider, wider rows, wider alleys are what you're going to need for this kind of shape would be my suggestion. Okay. So the next one would be this. I love this picture. This is from Silver Hill, Silver Hill Elder Flowers. Gosh, this is not my week to talk. And what these are, this is an elderberry orchard in um, the UK. This is, I want to say their third year that they are going into production. So these are relatively new. You can see they have that single trunk that they are shaping, a single cane. They've got it staked. It's only about, I believe, approximately three feet above ground. I've reached out to them for greater clarification, but I believe that that stake and that overall height is probably about three to four feet at the tallest. Mm -hmm. They'll leave it staked like this for several years and they'll allow that single trunk to develop into, into a strong enough form that it can support the overall shape of the plant. And then that, that uh, will just, that post will be taken out or it'll be allowed to rot away. Um, what they're doing with this, once they get their, their plant in the ground, for several years, they're gonna keep all the suckering branches off the side, trimmed off. Any suckers that come up from the crown of the plant will be taken off. So that it is just focused on growing that central leader out like that. It's not really a central leader. We just have kind of a lack of term to call it, but shaping them like this over time will decrease the suckering around the plant in Sambucus nigra. So I should clarify, this is Sambucus nigra. These are the European varieties that we're discussing. This is what's being shown. And this is what um, gave me the idea and several of us growers that maybe we should be looking at cerulea like this because cerulea wants to grow in this shape. It wants to produce that primary cane to support the plant. So um, the nice thing about this form is it is compact. It keeps what is kind of a taller of the Sambucus more compact, growing in a shape that it likes to be. It increases operational space between the rows, also allows you to maybe plant them slightly closer together than what you could in a hedge because those hedge are 25 feet wide up, up to. Mm -hmm. So it allows a little bit more room in there for commercial operation. Now, again, um, it looks beautiful. I don't think I've had anybody that has looked at that photo and went, what a terrible looking idea because it's so appealing. And one of us as one of the things we have to think about as farmers going into this is that we're not just growing a product. A lot of us are growing an experience. We are having um, campers come out to our place. We're having tours, we're having dinners, we're having field days, we're having all these things that are happening to get people to come out and admire the beauty of our place because we're able to kind of cross merchandise or cross market our, our 
fields and our farms and generate more revenue. So having something that looks very appealing like this, that makes people want to come and visit and bring their friends and family, this is advantageous as well. Okay. So here we see the um, Sambucus nigra cerulea kind of in its wild form. So it's suckering, it's got canes going every which way. If you look though in the center, you can see that strong central cane wanting to establish itself. So how do we prune that and why do we wanna prune it? Well, you know, we can prune it to help control that growth, keep pest and disease down, make the plant more productive. When it's older, it can be sometimes less productive if it's not maintained, increase suckering. Uh, and it, it just is not very tidy um, for getting in there to water it and to maintain your hoses and um, weeds and all these things. So um, shaping it has many pluses. So this is an older plant. It's going to be a lot harder to do that. I would probably get in there and pull out some of those, uh, those smaller canes and clean that up and uh, start taking care of it that way. But, um, but there it is in its natural wild state. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yes. So this is just for me to add on about um, the pruning down we are where we are in California with the Sambuca cerulea. Um, because we've talked about all the, you know, the, the careful thoughts of pruning. Well, one of the ranches where we um, went to um, go and take some cuttings had actually gone ahead and done some massive pruning of some of the trees we were using, um, we were harvesting from. So this on the left is one of the elderberry trees. It's, you know, it's like a 25 foot tree. It's absolutely gigantic. And they'd taken it back down to just only the trunks and a few and a few sticks. And we just thought, okay, well, maybe the tree's gonna die. Well, that spring, it was fully flushed out with like seven foot new canes. I mean, it was absolutely gigantic and it had the, the flower clusters on the right. I mean, they're the size of dinner plates. They just were gigantic and it was the same year. So perhaps down in California where we are with a longer growing season, cause ours is quite long. Um, maybe that, that works with the fruiting, you know, on that first year growth. Um, and if you are not in the area with the Valley elderberry longhorn beetle, and you can prune significantly, then you know there's some real hope for um, for having a super resilient plant that just loves a really good haircut and and, and makes good results. So, right. um, so just wanted to throw that in there too. I love it. I love those those are the best smelling flowers I have ever smelt, and they're just like citrusy, lemon, honey, marshmallow. Sunshine. Yeah. yeah. It's just amazing. They're the most amazing flowers. So yeah. yeah, it's so interesting. And you were saying also that you have seen where literally they've just mowed them down and, uh, right. and they've just sprung right back up again. That's right. So same thing down here, I think because of our really long growing season in at this same field farther down in this hedgerow, they actually fully mowed a whole bunch of suckers down to the ground. Wow. And that same year they came back with huge, with huge heads and flowered, you know, the fruit might not have formed in time, but where we are with this um, location, it, it doesn't make great fruit anyway. So we only pick the flowers there. So yeah, really, really fascinating that they really like a really good pruning and it leads to great big signs that same year. So, wow, that is phenomenal. Yeah. They, they, uh, the department of transportation mowed down one and it, and it shot right back up again, but I kept holding my fingers, just hoping it was going to do some sort of fruiting and flowering and it just didn't. So yeah. it's hard to say with that one, if it was just that one specifically, but um, I'm really excited to be pruning and getting, getting on these this year and just exploring what are going to be the things that work. That's what's so exciting. And, and I just cannot um, stress enough that we don't know what is going to be the best thing for all areas right now. This is completely uncharted territory. And we're starting to get universities involved and UC Serif is on the very cusp of that, um, but we just don't know. And so we need farmers to be researchers and work together to see if we can promote these native blue elderberries in a variety of ways for a variety of uses and in a variety of settings. So um, just don't be afraid to ask the questions and say, 
well, I'm going to try it in my own field and see what the best, um, what the best chance is. So, and we'll continue sharing our information both through the West Coast Elderberry Growers Group and future future stuff that um, that Kirsten's cooking up and we're working on because it's true, um, we are all gonna be the researchers um, in this discovering what works best for Cerulea. So Kirsten, I wanna thank you so much yes. for re-recording this, for um, for all of your careful, you know, note-taking of your own work and, and all the research um, as we move forward with Cerulea. Yes, and I just noticed that my kids' name from their homeschool group is on my computer. So I apologize. My name is not Garrick and Cineva. That's my my twins names. So I do apologize for that. Um, but yes, thank you so much for doing this and for everybody joining. I can't wait to see everybody back on uh, February 3rd, I believe it is. Yep. Doing this again. So thanks, Katie. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Sonia Brode with the University of California, where I work with the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetle, which is especially important for anybody in California and specifically the Central Valley who's interested in growing elderberry to know about. So uh, we call it VELB for short. So first of all, what is the VELB? So this is a rare species of beetle that relies entirely on elderberry for food and habit and habitat. Uh, so it lives inside the elderberry stems. And in fact, the larvae bore into the stems where they feed on the pith and undergo several developmental stages, which may last up to two years. And they then emerge as these adults, as in the picture. Um, and they, the adults live only a few weeks where they mate and then eventually die. So many of us may never have seen one of these beetles as it lives most of its life inside the elderberry. Uh, just because you have elderberry on your land does not mean that you necessarily have the valley elderberry longhorn beetle because it's only really found in certain places or it's been observed in certain places. However, <clears throat> biologists do consider the species range to be the entire bottom reaches of the Central Valley. So anywhere in the Central Valley that's approximately below 500 feet in elevation. And so why do elderberry growers need to be concerned about the Valley elderberry longhorn beetle? So this is a threatened species uh, according to the Federal Endangered Species Act. So this means that regulations apply to elderberry plants within the range, so just in the Central Valley. And these regulations uh, are about managing elderberry plants apply even on private land. And the most important regulations you need to be aware of uh, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service is that any elderberry stems larger than one inch in diameter may not be cut from the plant or removed from the site because those larger stems are where if you have any elderberry longhorn beetle, they would be in those larger stems. Um, also, any required trimming, such as of smaller stems, less than one inch, should occur between November and February. Um, and it's important to note that harvesting of flowers or berries is not restricted in any way. It's just the cutting of stems that's really regulated. Um, and so um, what's important to realize about this is that some of the recommended pruning uh, methods for elderberry in other parts of the country, like cutting the plant all the way down to the ground, you know, we do not really recommend that if you're in the Central Valley because that could potentially disturb the habitat uh, for this beetle. So you have to use uh, more conservative pruning methods. However, there is another way um, around some of these regulations and these arrangements are called programmatic safe harbor agreements. So what this is, is um, usually a local administering organization sets up an agreement with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then as a landowner, you don't have to interact with the Fish and Wildlife Service at all. Instead, you contact the administering organization 
and you can then enter into this agreement as a landowner by working with the organization. And usually what they'll do is they will come out and establish a baseline number of elderberry plants on the property out for, at the time that you want to enter the agreement. And then this gives you the freedom to manage. So if you want to plant more elderberries and manage them through pruning, or later, if they're not to your liking, you can remove them entirely. You can do all of that as long as you never go below the baseline number of elderberries that would be listed in your agreement. Um, and so we know of such an agreement existing for the seven Sacramento Valley counties at this point in time. And the organization that administers that is the Sacramento River Forum. So you can look them up. They have a website and uh, you can reach out to them if you're interested. We also have a lot more detailed information on all of this on our website on Elderberry. And you can see the URL down at the bottom of the slide. Thank you very much. I'm Katie Fury. I was the lead farmer um, for the UC Serap study uh, in 2018 to 2020 that looked at uh, mostly blue elderberry in a hedgerow context here in California. I'm here to talk a little bit about blue elderberry in particular, focusing on the fact that it is a native plant with a really long history of growing here in the West and also being tended by native people here as well. So because it's native, um, bonus, it's possible to get a good yield with relatively low intensity production, meaning you can use fewer inputs like fertilizer and water and ideally labor as well. So, and the reason we can do this is that blue elderberry is native, meaning it's genetically adapted to our particular environmental conditions because they've had a really, really long time to adapt and don't need as much babying now to do well compared to other crops. However, as we've learned, this one subspecies, blue elderberry, is native to a really large range uh, out here in the West, from Mexico to BC, coastal California to thousands of feet in elevation in the Sierra Nevada mountains and beyond. So that represents a really large range of environmental conditions. And so not all blue elderberry are created equal. Plants adapt to their local environments, which can change significantly even over really tiny difference, differences, I mean distances, let alone the distance between Central America and Canada. So to rely on the fact that these plants are locally adapted for lower intensity production, you really need to work with plants that are actually locally adapted, not just the right subspecies. So the way to make that happen is to propagate from plants that um, are living as close to your area as possible and doing well. So this, in addition to um, allowing you to work with lower intensity practices because your plant is locally adapted, it also means that you are protecting the long-term resilience of your local uh, native blue elderberry populations because you're not bringing in genes from far away that can mix with those wild plants and potentially reduce the ability of their seedlings to thrive in the future. So genetic diversity is really good for resilience um, of a population, but it does matter where that diversity comes from. If you're bringing in traits and, and therefore genetic diversity from plants that are adapted to a different environment entirely, you're more likely to introduce something harmful for that natural population. So reduced cold tolerance could be an example of that. Um, planting seedlings that are propagated from nearby plants will positively impact the genetic diversity of the local elderberry population. Um, but not everyone wants to work with seedlings because the consistency and predictability of cultivars is really helpful for commercial production. Um, so I want to take a second and just advocate right here for developing many, many different cultivars at a regional scale or a bioregional scale rather. So we can have that predictability of using cultivars, um, but with the benefits of 
more local adaptation and also less risk to our existing natural elderberry populations. So we've already talked about one really widely successful model for low intensity production, at least here in California, which is by installing native plant hedgerows. And elderberry is a really common element in hedgerows currently. Um, and we have seen that unirrigated trees can be really productive in that setting. So as part of that UC Serif study from 2018 to 2020, I had the pleasure of observing and harvesting from nine established blue elderberry trees that are currently in hedgerows, which are completely unirrigated at this point. The trees were about four to 10 years old. There was a bit of a range and they were pretty big trees because they were basically unpruned their entire lives. And there was really, there was a lot of berries on those trees. Um, the younger trees that were about four years old yielded around 40 to 60 pounds of berries each in a single growing season. And then the older ones that were eight to 10 years old, um, four out of six of those trees yielded over a hundred pounds of berries. And one, my favorite tree, um, yielded 170 pounds in one summer of really sweet, tasty grape, grape flavored berries. So all of that was just to emphasize that unirrigated trees in hedgerows can be really productive, but that should not be surprising to you because blue elderberry was growing here long before drip line was ever invented. I'm going to take one quick second to relocate because this sunspot is interesting. Okay, so the general formula for hedgerow installation in California is like this. So number one, pick your site, control your weeds, assess your soil for compaction and other issues, make a plan. Second, prep your ground. Normally this means disking and harrowing or rototilling or something like that. Um, ideally you'll mulch the area. And if you need, if you have compaction issues, you might do a deep rip on the soil or you just completely skip tillage entirely and do a restoration style planting, um, whatever fits your needs. And then you plant whenever that makes sense in your environment most. So here in Mediterranean California, planting in the fall or the winter is best because the cooler temperatures and winter rains when they come um, help the plants establish more successfully. And then once they're planted, you will irrigate for the first three years or so. So here where I am in the Sacramento Valley of California, where we have um, a dry season and a wet season being Mediterranean, we'll irrigate for three summers um, and you control weeds and squirrels in that time. And then once you irrigate for those first few years, um, you just remove irrigation. Um, because the plants have been established and now they're ready to scavenge for their own water. And once irrigation is removed, all you have to do is basic maintenance moving forward, weed control especially. So um, this method works in many, many different places. Hedgerows have been installed this way in many locations throughout California. Um, and Especially when elderberry is planted with a mix of other native species, these hedgerows are a really excellent way of bringing in ecological value to a piece of land, especially and in addition to that economic value of um, the elderberry. And it also doesn't cut into your current crop production because the hedgerows, by definition, fit along the borders of fields and along the border of your property. And hedgerows, I will say, are quite beautiful and they can create a deeper sense of place as you get to know the local native plants and watch them grow. So they're great in many ways and you can even get technical and financial assistance to install hedgerows, which is another extra bonus. There are grants available for hedgerow installation, which will be talked about more in the next webinar session. Um, and there's lots of places to find more to find support and more information like your local NRCS chapter. There's a really great organization called the Wild Farm Alliance. Um, and there's also Hedgerows Unlimited, which is a California based company run by Sam Earnshaw. Um, and they do hedgerow uh, consultations and installation support. You can also look up elderberry specific hedgerow information 
on the UC Serap elderberry page. Okay, so as I mentioned, that hedgerow model is really great for many different native plants, um, but to focus on elderberries needs in particular, we can observe plants that are growing naturally or in unirrigated hedgerows currently. And to learn lessons about what they need, we can also look to the wisdom of native land stewards for guidance, as of course they have an extremely long history of tending elderberry in an ecologically integrated way. So talking about irrigation um, and water needs, for example, naturally you most often see elderberry in riparian forests and in places where moisture collects like at the bottom of a cliff wall or something like that. So with that observation and the experience of many people growing elderberry, we agree that elderberry likes water. So it might sound strange to remove the irrigation completely, but as a native plant, um, they're adapted really well, and that means partly that they're just really, really good at finding the water that they need um, and then dealing with it when they run out. They have really extensive root systems, and in places where there is moisture to find, like stored really deep down in the soil or seeping into the soil from a creek nearby, um, unirrigated elderberry will do great. So. For example, in places like the Sacramento Valley of California, where I am, the soils are really, really deep, and we get a decent amount of winter rain, or we're supposed to. So even though it's really hot and dry here in the summer, um, so we're talking about basically always in the 90s, and it's not infrequent to dip into the hundreds, um, and we also get zero rain for at least half the year, our blue elderberry, as I mentioned, does great with irrigation, without irrigation once they're established because that extensive root system can access moisture stored deep down in the soil. Um, and so in places like this, um, you'll see elderberry not just in riparian forests, but also um, in widespread savanna-like arrangements. However, I should say even in these conditions, where elderberry has plenty of soil to scavenge from, um, having extra water nearby does seem to help. So observing those established unirrigated elderberry trees that I mentioned, those that were closer to a nearby water source. So one example would be an irrigated walnut orchard. Um, those trees seem to stay green and growing for longer in the summer than those hedgerows that were in drier, more isolated locations away from irrigated fields. Um, blue elderberry is drought deciduous, meaning that they basically just go dormant when the soil dries out to a certain extent and then start to grow again when the rains return. So going dormant isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just blue elderberry expressing its amazing um, adaptation to this droughty environment. Um, but having them go dormant earlier in the summer could sacrifice some of the total year yield for that year because blue elderberry um, has such a long growing um, and harvest season. So again, that's specific to places like where I am that do have a really, really long growing season. We, in, in our study, we saw um, basically a three month harvest season that was increasing and making kind of a bell curve like that. So very long. Um, so backtracking, so there are places that your trees may not do well or survive without irrigation, even if you spend those first few years getting them established. Um, for example, if you're on hilly ground or somewhere else where deep moisture isn't accessible for whatever reason, you may never be able to remove irrigation completely from your trees unless you put them close to another moisture source that you don't mind them scavenging from, um, like a creek or a drainage ditch or tailwater pond or something like that. But you should keep in mind that they will scavenge from your crops. So that's something to keep in mind with location. Um, so either way, um, whether you're somewhere where they will do well without irrigation or not, um, the blue elderberry will always readily accept and could improve yields from giving them an occasional drink over the dry season. 
Um, however, you should be careful um, for Mediterranean, Mediterranean adapted native plants. Summer water can reduce the lifespan or just kill uh, some species like manzanita. So you should be really careful if you're working with a multi-species hedgerow. Okay, so from the traditional ecological knowledge of native peoples here as the original stewards of blue elderberry, we can also learn a lot. Um, I'll talk here a little bit about pruning and nutrient um, like fertilization lessons as inspired by native um, land stewardship practices, particularly speaking about fire. Okay, so we're going to have a little story time before we get into lessons learned. Okay, so before the age of fire suppression, which we're in right now, where fire is feared and any fire that starts is immediately put out. Um, and these practices were started by Spanish um, colonizers and then driven home by the Americans. Um, the Before all that, native peoples of what's now California were working extensively uh, with fire as part of their land stewardship systems. They were burning a lot every year. I think I read somewhere that it was around a million acres a year, potentially. And this was happening over a very, very long time. And as we were talking about before, plants adapt to their environment. And in this case, native land stewardship was a like an integral part of those environmental conditions. So this burning now is necessary for many native plants to regenerate and be as productive and healthy as possible. The plants themselves, as well as entire ecosystems and, and uh, plant communities came to rely on these cultural burns because of how long they were going on for. So, and now we see the consequences of removing native people and their land stewardship practices um, in combination with the effects of climate change. We um, have a hundred years or so without frequent burns to reduce the fuel load of our wild wild lands. So we have now these massively destructive fires that are burning really wild and really hot, um, which is really different than the type of fire um, that was happening before, where regenerating healthy fires will sweep more gently across the landscape. And of course, Elderberry shrubs would burn up in these cultural burns, uh, which is basically akin to coppicing an elderberry plant, um, meaning, so coppicing meaning cutting it down to the ground. And then soon after these burns, which would happen in the fall, um, because it's dry enough to burn, but then the rains come and put them out. Um, after the, sh the elderberry would be burned to the ground, um, they start sprouting again from their root crown when the rain returns. So um, traditional ecological knowledge teaches us that coppicing blue elderberry may actually be a really good long-term pruning strategy for these plants. But an important thing to note is that these urns weren't happening every year in a particular place. The land was burned in patches um, and each patch was burned after a certain number of years and that interval is called the fire return interval. And this is also great because you have um, places where you have elderberry shrubs that are older and productive, and then you can burn down another patch and they kind of stagger each other. So they have constant berry availability, um, but you're also making sure to refresh those plants at a proper interval. So the fire return interval is really different depending on your location, your plant community, and local practices of indigenous peoples in the area. Um, but I think it would be, it's really inspiring and interesting to try and take guidance from the local fire return interval to guess at what frequency might be best for coppicing elderberry. So um, as a side note, uh, here in the Sacramento Valley and other places in the Central Valley of California, where we have the Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetle, that little threatened beetle, um, you can't coppice the shrub because you can't cut any wood that's over one inch in diameter. So a method called pollarding, um, which is kind of like coppicing, except you only cut, excuse me, the smaller wood on top down to a certain height, like a meter or so. 
that pollarding might be a good alternative method. And I um, learned that originally from a really amazing uh, woman named Sage Lapina, who is a Wintu um, ethnobotanist and clinical herbalist living in the Sacramento area. Um, okay, so yeah, pollarding is a good alternative to that. And again, the fire return intervals can range really widely, so I encourage you to go do some research on your specific location, which indigenous groups are local to your area, their land stewardship practices, their burning practices, and anything you can find out about what pre-colonial fire return intervals look like. As an example, here in coastal California in Amamutsin territory, um, I read a quote from Rick Flores, who says that um, in that area, the woodlands would be burned about every seven to 10 years and that uh, the prairies would be burned more frequently, like every three to five years. So that might be uh, a bit of a starting point. Um, but fire isn't just a pruning method. However, um, in addition to it fitting into a larger spiritual um, and cultural context, fire uh, controls pests, it controls disease, um, and also recycles nutrients. Um, as well as increasing yield and quality of berries. So um, this suggests that blue elderberry might actually enjoy being fertilized with ash um, and potentially its own ashes, especially as well as the ashes of native plants that would grow nearby naturally. Um, the Cache Creek Conservancy Tending and Gathering Garden here in Woodland is where I first heard of this idea. Um, they're experimenting with this um, burning method uh, which is basically, we'll call it fire mimicry. Um, in addition to prescribed burning of lower plants like grasses, they're doing this fire mimicry with their larger shrubs like redwood and elderberry, where you coppice or do a severe pruning some other way, make a burn pile next to your plant or somewhere nearby, burn those branches, and then spread the ash back around the plant. And I haven't tried this yet, but I'm pretty excited to this year doing some pruning experiments in the hedgerows we planted as part of that study. And I'm excited to see how that goes. So the Cache Creek Tending and Gathering Garden is also, I want to point out, an amazing general example of reintegrating native land stewardship in a holistic way, where native folks are holding key leadership roles, they're working in the garden with other volunteers, and then are also able to harvest, um, you know, to gather important resources for their own use as well. And I think it's just wonderful. And with all that loving um, tending from people, the garden looks gorgeous as well. And this, in my mind, is a great model for increasing local Native people's access to important resources that they need. Um, of course, returning ownership of land in Native people's uh, ancestral territory is the best way to do this, but in the meantime, I think this tent and gathering garden model can be reflected elsewhere and could possibly make some good impacts. I see hedgerows, um, native plant gardens, other restoration plantings as really amazing opportunities for, um, for having this type of relationship grow and when you have the right people in the right place at the right time. So. And hedgerows especially because hedgerow maintenance is something most farmers don't have or take time to do. Um, this leads in the hedgerows to more plant loss, weeds taking over, and also just generally the plants giving up, sort of senescing over time because, like I was mentioning, the plants, especially here in California, have adapted over time to human maintenance and attention. So in addition to these possibilities of small um, land tending relationships. There are also examples of larger scale relationships that I want to point out because they're just awesome and um, have the potential for making a lot of wonderful impacts. Um, okay, here's a couple in this area. We have the Amamutsen Land Trust in relationship with Pi Ranch uh, here in coastal California, um, where Pi Ranch has offered free access to a chunk of land for the Amamutsen Land Trust folks to plant and maintain important cultural plants. 
awesome. Um, the Esalen people, which is another coastal California nation, uh, was recently able to purchase over a thousand acres of land in their ancestral territory, which is the Adler Ranch in Big Sur. And they did that using grant funds from the state of California under Proposition 68. Cool. Um, and then also the Segorate Land Trust in Oakland um, is doing land rematriation land rematriation uh, work in the East Bay of California in Oakland. Um, they're working with Planting Justice, which is a nonprofit in the area that is going to be transferring the new land, Segorate, um, free of charge, as well as supporting them in their efforts to purchase land in the East Bay. And then elsewhere, you have individual landowners doing similar things, which is pretty awesome. Um, so anyways, to wrap up, all of this is to say that I am an advocate and a personally a huge fan of cultivating blue elderberry in ways that keep in mind um, and benefit from the fact that it is a native plant. And I'm also a huge fan of growing blue elderberry in ways that restore the ecological landscape that blue elderberry has been part of for so long. And native peoples have been and are a huge part of that ecology. And now that the rest of us non-native people are here, we're part of that ecology as well. So I want to see us all in our farms and gardens continue to work to become more and more integrated into our ecological systems together in an increasingly healthy and mutually supportive way. So that is it. And I want to encourage you, if you're excited about this stuff too, and you're interested in continuing discussions with me and um, maybe putting together a group of folks that want to continue this discussion and do some organizing together, please don't reach, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I believe my email address is in the handout somewhere. So I would love to hear from you and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar um, and I'll see you later. Okay. Now I have to stop this recording. Um, last little bit that I'm going to be talking about are the flowers. Remember the flowers. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about flowers in the next workshop. And my guess is we will actually end up having a standalone workshop dealing with flowers in the future because it is an entirely separate and very important um, market for the flowers. Um, this is Sambucus cerulea, the native blue elders. I personally love their flowers um, more than the Sambucus canadensis. The, the aroma and the flavor is, is absolutely outstanding. Um, but so th the current market price for flowers is about $40 a pound for certified organic dried de-stemmed flowers. And um, Chris could probably correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it takes about 10 pounds of fresh flowers to make one pound of dried. Is that, am I on target for that, Chris? Uh, seven or eight pounds. Okay. At Great. least for the canadensis. Okay. Um, the benefits of it, there, it's a, there's a really strong market for dried flowers. Pretty much all of it is imported from Europe. Um, there is a hyper local market for fresh flowers. So if you live near restaurants, breweries, ice cream makers, bars, pastry makers, they are um, el fresh elderflowers are in hot demand in high, generally in high end um, restaurants and bars. Um, the benefit of dr dried ones is that they're really easy and cheap to transport. Um, you know, it's not 25 pound buckets of fresh berries. It is these small elderflowers. The health and immune benefits of flowers are um, in some ways equal, if not more to than berries. I'm not gonna get into that now. We can do that when we do a more in-depth look at the flowers themselves, but they're nothing to sneeze at. So it's not like a, you know, it, it can be its own viable crop. Um, if you're picking the flowers, then you don't have to worry about as many things like the spotted wing drosophila and some of the other things that hit fruit set um, because you're picking them before that. And it can be a little bit easier if you don't have access to um, frozen storage space, they don't take as, up as much room. The challenge is, is scale, scaling up how to mechanize the de-stemming process, 
drying space and labor um, costs. So here's a picture of just some ideas about, about scaling up the flowers. Um, this is Ted's elderberry, Terry's elderberry destemmer, Ted. Um, he's Midwest elderberry, uh, he's River Hills Harvest, and he has invented this uh, machine. It's a shaker table, it shakes back and forth for the berries. He's recently been doing trials on it with the flowers and it's working really well. I tried putting the flowers through our modified grape destemmer that we use for the berries and it was a disaster. They came out just like a mush. So more work to be done in that area. But right now, um, really people are drying them first and then destemming them by hand um, after they are dry. So using a drying rack, using a dehumidifier or dehydrator, I mean, or um, freeze dryers. Um, and then after they are dry, then rubbing them over a um, uh, rubbing them over hardware cloth or you know a, a stainless steel cookie cooling rack um, or other type of screen or rubbing them between your hands. So that's the challenge of it. It is labor intensive. Um, so what should we be doing right now as we wrap up? It's January here. Um, what should you be doing right now if you really are gung-ho and want to get going on elderberries this year? Um, number one, secure your sources for cuttings. Most likely they will be delivered in February or March. Um, remember this is mostly Sambucus canadensis that there are available sources for cuttings. There are some that we talked about for cerulea that are in the notes from the first workshop. Um, but that's still, you know, it, that's a whole market in and of itself is that. Um, work on your financials. Um, Jed has given us a few links and those are in your handouts this time as also last time for working on your financials. Um, plan your field prep. Make sure you, you know, you, your site selection, if you need to do any input soil tests, et cetera. Um, if you're taking your own cuttings, this is the time for Canadensis to do it right now. Um, or um, if you're doing Cerulea, you know, all bets are off. Just try it anytime from now through through um, budding of flowers. Uh, there's been a study that has looked at all those different stages and even up to where the flowers are budding, you can take some cuttings. Um, but the, you know, the jury's still out on what is the best way of doing that. Remember, we talked about that in the first workshop. Um, keep learning. Go through these handouts really carefully. Click on all those links. Um, and go to Midwest Celebrate Co-op, go to the presentations. Um, Chris has a bunch of stuff there. Um, talk to future buyers, see where you are going to be able to sell them. I am, uh, as Carmel Berry Company hat on, I am, you know, very eager to meet people and talk with you about um, future buying because we are only, uh, we're determined to not source imported. And so that means we can only grow at the pace of um, what is available to us in American elderberries and flowers. Um, Midwest Elderberry Co-op, I mean, Chris got hundreds of thousands of requests, uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of requests, and they just simply could not fill them. So, you know, there are, the, yes, there is a market for elderberries, if you have been wondering that. Um, but, you know, buyers like me or buyers like Midwest Elderberry Co-op have specific um, sanitation and packing requirements. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that you have been communicating ahead of time, not just waiting until you have some Ziploc bags full of berries in your freezer. And, and just to interrupt briefly, but I have substituted some blue cerulea for those used to using the canadensis. Yeah, it's on. It's the beginning of it. Thanks yeah, the buyers you. will take it. Yep. Um, and what else can you do right now? You can connect and stay in touch, please. We want to continue this forum. Um, the best way right now until we have a West Coast Elderberry Growers Workshop um, webpage up and going, which Kirsten is awesomely spearheading, um, the best place to, to continue to share and ask questions is the West Coast Elderberry Growers um, Facebook group. Again, this is for commercial growers focused on the West Coast. For other commercial growers, um, Elderberry Growers Connect and New Elderberry Growers are two other Facebook pages. If you are a hobbyist, then Elderberry World is the Facebook group for you. Um, so that's it. Next workshop, we are going to have focus on harvest, post-harvest handling, more on flowers, 
and more on financials and available grants and support and certifications. So we are going to be able to talk more about the grants that Sonia referred to about hedgerows, or maybe Katie did. Um, so that's going to be really great information. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the chat and um, hit some of your questions. I know that quite a few of these have been have answered as we um, as we have gone along. So um, question: I'm noticing all my elder plants of the, all species in containers continuing to put out small, slow vegetative growth. None are 100% dormant. Anyone else experiencing this? Um, uh, Jed, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I don't know. Like, um, that seems to be a thing, even here in my field, especially with the really young um, plants. Uh, this year, everybody went dormant, and I thought that was actually kind of unusual. But yeah, especially when they're young, you get little bits of, well, it just tells you just how cold tolerant they are, frost tolerant. You know, they've got little leaves on them even in winter. And uh, yeah. hopefully, you don't get too much snow sticking to it, pulling the plant down, but other than that. Be fine. Yeah, when they're in container, they're going to be a little stunted. So you're going to want to work on putting them in the ground as soon as you can. And, um, and, you know, we recommend, I think, across the board, no pruning the first year to help them get established. Um, uh, just, just briefly on that, we've had circumstances when we get a flash freeze, and it uh, freezes the sap in the cane, shattering the cane. In the spring, if you haven't cut it down, those canes will be dead, but the plant is not. You just have to cut them out. Great. Next question, I'm curious about determinants of flowering in cerulea. Now this is, um, I mean, it, it, cerulea in general is indeterminate, which means they just keep on making flowers, you know, from M April, May, all the way through November, I have seen flowers still produced. So, um, yeah, th there is a big range for that. Um, have you observed that certain types of cerulea are more determinate versus indeterminate? Since we do not have any known cultivars of cerulea yet, just keep on watching your local plants if you want to take um, cuttings from them. You know, see which ones tend to have a, a larger flush of flowers at a given time, and maybe that's the one you want to go, go for. Um, how do you feel pruning affects determinants? That kind of can. can um, the ones that were mowed down or cut all the way to the trunk um, at one of our locations, they actually seem to all flower and um, uh, fruit within a much smaller window. So maybe that helps. Incorporating a uh, biochar. Um, you know, Chris, you might want to answer that or you might be able to answer that because I know River Hills Harvest recommends biochar quite a bit. Yeah, basically, you know, especially for the canadensis, for sure. We know that the, the roots aren't hairy. It's, it's dependent on the fungal environment to feed the plant. And so having the, the biochar in there mixed with your compost and manure does seem to add and help. I, I, in my own, you know, smaller scale, I, I always burn my uh, cuttings and excess from pruning and then mix that in my compost. Thank you. It provides little homes for the, you know, healthy bacteria and stuff like that. They live yeah. in that. And then you have the mineral aspects too. For sure. Um, this is from some, another suggestion that grazing can help with hedgerows. Yeah, that's an interesting thought for sure. Um, Katie Fury, can we attend some of these classes? That might have been when I was juggling and I didn't hear about classes. You know what she's talking about? I think uh, I was mentioning the classes that are taught at that tending and gathering garden. Got it. Um, I think that's what it's referring to. And um, I would just encourage you to go check out their website. It's the Cache Creek Conservancy Tending and Gathering Garden in Woodland, California. They're all really friendly. It's a small place, so I'm sure they'll answer your questions for you. Great. Um, and there's just another comment on the herding. Um, herding of grazing herds. Um, 
some regenerative, Chris says, some regenerative growers of Canadians have started to experiment with herd animals browsing of the canes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I know that some people put their chickens in their field and goats. But, you know, the thing to consider with that is you absolutely have to be compliant with food safety rules. And there is a certain number of days before harvest that you need to have your animals out of the field. So you would really want to make sure that you um, double check on that. Yeah, we do it all post harvest. Yeah, and then if you, as long as you have them out before, the, you know, I think it's 120 days or something before the next growing season, you've got you've got a couple months in there, which can be some real beneficial. Right, and with canadensis, that's not a problem because after they browsed a month or so later, things are going dormant anyway, and we're going to cut it all down and flail it up and break it up. Yeah. Um, Sonia, here's one for you, I think. Um, curious what Davis's studies or other people's experience have, have to say on the topic of introducing or passing along populations of beneficial microbes um, that Cerulea seems readily form associations with. Presumably this varies on site-specific local regional scale. And it'd be interesting if there were certain soil microbes that the plants tend to associate with. Has that been looked at at all? No, it has not. But yeah, very interesting question. <laughs> Something I'd like to pass on to my soil science colleagues for sure. <laughs> and we know that from other, you know, orchards with with oak trees basically talking to each other through mycelium or walnut trees or something like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, another question, do you have to decide if you're going to do flowers or berries or both? Um, this is, a, um, I can answer this one, uh, and I think Chris would probably agree, There's, the studies in the Midwest with University of Missouri have shown that you can harvest up to about a third of your flowers um, and not affect your overall yield of berries. And the way that that is possible is they are harvesting the flowers that probably wouldn't make viable fruit anyway. The fruit at the bottom it's, it's darker shade, more shaded, less ventilation, so it might be more susceptible to spotted wing drosophila. Or as the fruit um, formed, it would fall down and touch the ground and would not be able to be used anyway. So yeah, if you, you, know, you can harvest both the flowers and the berries um, with good results. I, I do have a few growers that are focusing only on flowers. And part of that has to do with the labor issues come the fall. And part of it is they just don't want to mess with having to handle the berries. And so they're just going to grow flowers. And um, Main Street Project in, in Northfield, Minnesota is one of those. And they're working on uh, improved methods of drying based on using herbal drying techniques uh, developed in the Pacific Northwest. Great. Uh, Jed, go ahead. I have a comment um, for someone who, for a grower who is in as short of a season as I am in salmon arm BC, you are going to find that a whole bunch of the flowers are occurring too late in the season to ever ripen into fruit. Okay. So for me, I have a cutoff date. It's like um, kind of it's the first or the second week of August and any flower which occurs after that would never produce fruit. So they get picked hundred percent of them. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, Jed, do you have any problems with deer? Amazingly, we do not have any problems with deer. They go out there, they hang out, they're not bothering anything. But in the Midwest, where they seem to have the same species of deer, I believe they have um, whitetail and mule yeah. deer, there, people do have problems with them. So somehow there's a regional taste preference. Uh, it hasn't been a problem in my field, but you're going to need to monitor for it. And I know. I think you guys have more deer in Burton than than I do. Anyway, your deer pressure might be higher, so your mileage may vary. You might get away with it like me, but might not. Okay, um, this is it, Kirsten. If you can take this one, it says um, for future talks, going over varietals of Canadensis in detail would be helpful. So that is a great point. Thank you. But there, um, I would like a short list of winners for the Western U.S. Also, is the native black elderberry canadensis worth growing if it's not if it's not a named cultivar? I'm assuming that's like if you go and find your own, you know, black elderberry canadensis 
um, and it's not one of the Bob Ranch, you know, one. Yes. Go in, ahead. In current market, yes, <laughs> they'll take anything. Yeah. As long as it's it's clean and doesn't have a lot of stems and it's all you know mostly ripe. Kirsten, can you speak to the winners that you think are for the Western U.S. so far yeah. and what you've been reading? Yeah, I mean, so so far, um, you know, those late season plants, um, we should probably do a list of that on the West Coast Elderberry Facebook page. Some of the late season varieties just, just seem to lag behind in my climate, probably would be different than the ones that would work well in, in yours. Obviously you have a longer growing season than what I have and I have a longer growing season than, than Jeb. But um, I noticed that ranch seems to somewhat flounder in my, in my condition. So I'm not sure yet if it's because it's near um, a location where there's more acidity in the soil. So within that, we can definitely talk about, about pushing out varieties that are a little bit sooner and mid-season ripeners as well. So I'll be happy to post those on the West Coast Elderberry Facebook page and the Facebook group as well. So I will do that today. Great. I know we're running over and I wanna respect everybody's time. Just a couple more quick things. Um, if you have something, somebody asked about spelling out one of the links, it's in your handouts that you got. All the links that were mentioned today are in your handouts that you received as a, um, an attachment to your email today. Um, uh, I think we'll mention, we'll talk about this at the next one, the neem oil, because yes, it can be taken up through the roots. Um, Chris, do you wanna take one, like 30 seconds about the neem oil, how it's applied? Well, you, you just mix it according to the instructions on the bottle. We're using the full neem oil. There are those that are more uh, miscible or they blend better with the water and that's good to use. And I asked Terry once if he had any measurement. He just said he puts it on heavy. And, uh, you know, it just drips the whole plant and directly onto the ground and everything else. And they just go through at a steady pace, putting it out. Great. Thank you. Okay, one last question about mulch. Um, using sawdust in compost and or used as a mulch. Jed, do you want to talk to that one? Yeah, I don't know if um, sawdust it might not be my preferred, like wood chips are better, especially if it happens to be from the branches of a tree. Um, I see people with other berry farms using sawdust. It might not, it wouldn't be my first choice, but uh, it could work. <laughs> okay. Agree. Um, I use right. wood chips. I like wood I, chips. I think we got to everybody's. If we did not get your question, and I'm really sorry about that, what I would like for you to do is please put it into the Facebook group if you are on Facebook. If not, email me directly, katie at carmelberry.com, and I will make sure that we get the answer to you. Um, once again, many, many thanks to our panelists for all of your expertise. I'm just so thankful. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, and we're looking forward to the next one on February 3rd.